over five years ago, six years ago, uh, that really gathered to work towards fostering a sustainable local economy here in the Wilds area and to learn skills and share skills and grow community to get us towards that goal. Uh, I know we have members of the coordinating committee here. If you'd be willing to stand up, this is the Wilds Economic Localization Coordinating Committee. Thank you. a little bit. Most of, most of the folks uh, involved in that are down in Ukiah area, though well, hopefully a few, a few people in Wellets are part of the Mendo Time Bank. Anyway, related to the uh, alternative currency thing, we're trying to put on a barter fair. There have been lots of them up in the Pacific Northwest for maybe decades that are really very successful. But we're starting on a small scale in Ukiah. I believe the location is going to be the Saturday afternoon clubhouse trying to finalize the date. It's likely to be March 13th. Um, but you can check out um, mendotimebank.com. Some of us have business cards related to that where there's some information on the table. But anyway, mendotimebank.com. And it'll be a barter fair, hopefully with very little use of money. So what we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to hear from each of our speakers about the projects that they're working on. Uh, There'll be short summaries, so we're keeping it short, both to be respectful of everyone's time, but also so that hopefully we can have some really good question and answer discussion afterwards. So if you're not part of our panel, but secretly want to be, that will be your opportunity. Okay, so we have wonderful guests here tonight. Uh, to my left is Cindy Logan. She works with NCO and WAG. That stands for North Coast Opportunities and Willits Action Group. Right, a uh, general mover and shaker and member of the Grange and extraordinaire. So she's going to be talking about the Mendo Food Futures uh, coupons. We have Oliver, who's actually, sorry, Oliver oh, sorry. Luke Delory <laughs> from British Columbia. He's the author of nine books, has hosted radio shows, scored documentary films, and has taught international development and is the author of the forthcoming Don't Pay For It, Trade For It. <laughs> So that'll be certainly relevant. And Oliver is going to give us a little snapshot of history of alternative currencies. So he's going to end up going first. This is Brett Cooper Ryder from Ukiah. Right? Is that where you're from? Uh, he's going to be speaking about Mendo Mula tonight. And lastly, we have Derek Huntington, who came all the way from Santa Rosa uh, to be with us tonight. So I want to thank you, everyone, for traveling to get here. He's going to be talking about their uh, Sonoma Go Local campaign, maybe he'll touch on the campaign and specifically talk about their local shopping buying card. So hopefully I think we can start with Oliver. Thank you, Holly, and thank you, Well, and thank you all for coming. <laughs> I really wanted to memorize my notes, but I don't have a photographic memory, so forgive me if I read a little bit. I'll keep it short. Um, barter is a form of exchange that utilizes goods and services instead of money. Um, I found in some of my research, and please let me know if uh, you think differently, I believe all currency is backed by two things. One is faith and one is trust. And I believe the economy anywhere, especially here in Mendocino County, depends upon the value that we each mutually agree upon, um, whether we're uh, exchanging seashells, sheep, uh, shillings, or services, uh, it really comes down to trust that underlies every transaction. Um, humans, plants, and animals have been in a symbiotic interdependent relationship since the beginning of time, and our survival, in fact, depends on it. Uh, I believe barter is well suited to small and mid sized communities and economies. Um, barter is built on reciprocal. Uh, uh, relationships and in fact it's my understanding that without barter and trade and partnering and cooperating small communities could not survive without it and that is in fact how we came to be where we are today. Bartering allows us to monetize our time, utilize our excess capacity and move our inventory all at a full value uh, depending on if you have excess inventory and instead of selling it to say a discount shop or 
I publish books, and instead of me sending them to the dollar store to get sold at pennies on the dollar, I can trade my, my goods and services at full value, and that also means that if I'm trading with you, you can trade your goods, your Blackberry Pies, your accounting services, your body work at, uh, on an even keel with me. I found that during the 1930s, uh, people joined together and established groups like the Unemployment Citizens League of Denver, which had 34,000 members that I believe got uh, the Denver area through the, the Depression. And in the 17th and 18th centuries, the colonists traded beaver pelts, corn, tobacco, and deerskin, which is where the term buck comes from. I found quickly here, the barter began with what is known as bi-directional trade, where I have something, you have something, we both want what each other has, we do it, it's a done deal, it's great. But when it arose that one person's goods or services had a different value than other, another person's goods and services, that's where problems arose and sometimes trade would break down, which is where what is known as multi-directional trade began with the advent of, say, a trade exchange or a, a, a trade broker or um, kind of like a middleman where if I wanted your blackberries, I would say, hey, uh, that flat of blackberries looks really purple and juicy and I really want them. And you say, well, what, what have you got to trade? I say, well, I can trade my desktop publishing services, and that's great, but you don't need desktop, pub desktop publishing services. So what I would do as a member of this trade exchange, I would go to this trade exchange and as a member be lent trade dollars or credits, say 20 trade dollars, and I would use this 20 trade dollars to pay you for your Blackberries, and then you could take this $20 which is trade uh, credits with the trade exchange, and you could turn around and go buy a pizza or get a really good cheap massage. Um, where am I? <laughs> I'm nearly done. Little Lake Grange. Little Lake Grange. Thank you all. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> it's so big, how could I not notice? Um, I'll end by saying I believe that in the future the strength of our local economy here in Mendocino County will depend upon our ability to cooperate and build and maintain relationships with each other using a value-based barter system. Great, thank you. Okay, it looks like we can move on to Brett. Brett, tell us about Mendo Mula. Okay, well, first of all, I'll tell you I'm not an expert on Mendo Mula. Um, <laughs> I happen to issue it, and I receive it in my business. I'm the owner and uh, general manager of Ukiah Brewing Company, and Dave Smith, who is not here, who I believe was the first one contacted to talk about it, talked me into coming up here and speaking. So I didn't really have a chance to completely pick his brain about you know important issues regarding local currency. But I learned enough from him to decide with my family to go ahead and issue some. Um, both Mulligan's Books, which is owned by Dave Smith, and Ukiah Brewing Company have <clears throat> approximately maybe up to $3,000 in circulation right now in the Ukiah area. And right now, I didn't realize this until about two weeks ago, there's over 30 businesses, local businesses in the Ukiah area or in the county accepting Mendo Mula. Everything from you know body workers to there's three restaurants. There, we're about to have another restaurant that will also issue currency uh, Mendo Mula in the same form. And I did bring some. If you want to take a look at it, I might pass some around later. We'll see how much I get back. But uh, these are ours. They have our little logo on them. They're five dollars. They're wooden, and they cost us a little bit. And they are basically. Um, five dollars for me, I like to think that they're backed by beer. You know, we, make, we do uh, 300,000 gallons of, you know, organic ales and lagers every year, and right now a pint does cost you five dollars. So, you know, I can actually use these if I want to buy five friends a beer, I can spend twenty-five dollars and give them each one of these wooden coins and they can come have that beer whenever they like. 
they can also go to Mulligan's Books and buy a book. Or if they have, you know, 25 of them, they can go get a massage. Um, the idea behind this currency, um, at least I'll tell you in Dave Smith's mind and in my mind, is to have that currency recirculate locally. And if you've heard about the multiplier effect, which I'm sure some of you have, the idea is to not have the, the currency go out of the county. And the more that we can recirculate it between local businesses, the better. Now, $3,000 isn't necessarily gonna have a huge effect, but other communities have put a, quite a bit of local currency into circulation, and then it can have a much larger effect. What it really does is when people learn about it, they're first interested because who doesn't like a wooden nickel, right? <laughs> um, I love them. I hung on to them when I was a kid, whether they were good for anything or not. Um, they, they will encourage people to start thinking about what happens to their money. It starts conversations in my business, and I expect all 36 of my employees to be able to tell people what it means to have their, you know, their currency circulate locally, and that you know, if you spend money with a, a business that is um, operating in Ukiah, but its corporate headquarters are in Georgia, when you spend money with that company, most of the money goes to Georgia. And if you spend money at Ukiah Brewing Company, that doesn't mean that the money stays locally because we don't get all of our goods and services from Ukiah. We wish we could, but we don't. So um, it starts that conversation and we can start to tell people that if you spend money in a local business, you know, you could have up to 45% of that money stay locally. But if you're spending money with a company that has employees here, but its corporate headquarters are in Georgia or New York City or even overseas, that normally, you know, 13 to 15 percent of it might actually stay locally. So I'd be happy to answer any questions I can about this when we're done, and uh, you know, would encourage you if you are interested in buying a beer for someone that you can do it this way now. We can also give you a piece of paper that says it's worth one beer, but this is a lot more fun. Derek, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, do you guys, uh, for the Mendo Mula, do you just sell them, or do you actually uh, put them out um, more than you actually sell? Um, I thought it would be a good idea to, um, to maybe go through briefly the third rule that we have for, for Mendo Mula right here. And that'll, I think that'll answer your question. Um, these were proposed rules that you know, anyone who's going to issue this same type of currency in our little system, it's that Mendo Mula will only be issued by the issuing merchant into circulation as change, direct exchange for cash, never sold, or as gift certificates. And, and that's, that's how it's done. So um, there is a new business that's interested in, in issuing the same type of currency, and they would like to do it just as gift certificates. So, you know, $10, $25, you know, two pieces or five pieces. And then that may not actually come back to their business. It could go to someone else's business. Um, that's a little interesting to me, and like I was explaining earlier, I was, you know, a little concerned that somebody will come, you know, and use all of someone else's issued currency in my business. That, in the long term, could, could hurt us quite a bit. But, uh, you know, I do think that more than likely the people who buy those as gift certificates at one business are generally probably going to come back to that business. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers that question. It's an, it's an exchange for cash. It's, five, it's worth $5. You know, our, our money in the United States and actually globally is based on, on debt and borrowing. And um, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but um, as that borrowing got more and more or lending and borrowing got more and more irresponsible, created this problem where once everybody realized that, um, all of a sudden these loans go bad, the money supply starts shrinking, businesses that want to make stuff, people that want jobs, just can't work because there's not the money to facilitate it. People that need things can't buy it from the businesses because there's just no money to make it happen. Uh, so what we're trying to create is a system that uh, will allow that trade to happen regardless of what's happening outside. Um, if you're interested in this topic, I recommend this book, uh, The End of Money and the Future of Civilization by Thomas Greco, great uh, theorist and uh, actually on the ground activist for local money systems. And he, he relates it to a, a, a breakwater in a community, like, a, like on a harbor, where you wouldn't just leave your harbor open to waves that come in and crash your boats to, to smithereens. You put up a breakwater so that it can, it can you know, keep the waters calm inside. And you're not closing it off. Those boats go in and out, okay? but it just creates a little more stability for that harbor. 
Um, the other one I like is the cell analogy. Uh, you create a membrane that still allows things to go in and out, but protects the, uh, the delicate structures inside that cell. So um, the way um, Oliver touched on, uh, on, on trade exchanges. And uh, so we use a process. We're promoting a process called credit clearing which essentially, and this isn't credit like debt credit, this is credit like the value that all of us have to bring into our community and into our economy. Um, and and we, what we're doing is essentially creating an accounting system that allows us to track this value being circulated. Um, you know, there's, it, it starts with the, uh, with the institutions in the community that, that are established and, and are, are uh, known to provide value um, on a pretty consistent basis, like your breweries, um, like your bookstores, like your, your local markets, and, and also your producers and, and, and the economy. Um, that's by, by kind of formalizing the value that they have and getting them to participate in this trade network, um, then you can just kind of track the trade and allow it to happen um, without necessarily needing money. Just keep track of it. It's just an accounting system. Um, what we've tried to do is because one of the uh, re one of the things we're trying to do right now is to stimulate our local economy. Um, you know, we we decided to go more of a kind of a citizen-oriented program first to encourage people to shop locally. And I don't know if you have a rewards card in your wallet for stores, but people are pretty pretty familiar with the idea of using a rewards card and saving money at this point. Um, so what this system allows you to do as a shopper is to shop at uh, different local businesses in the community and when you shop and spend money there they issue back a rebate. So our money is basically being created um, by the businesses who are buying uh, you know, customer loyalty essentially. Um, you know, or, or, and, and then that, mo that money gets onto your card and you can go use that um, at another business. Plus, the businesses can use it with each other. Um, and you can add credit lines so that they have more liquidity and, and kind of manage their working capital more effectively, uh, ways to maintain stability in their business operations. Um, and pretty soon, you have a nice little trust network going where, um, again, you can trade with each other uh, without uh, necessarily needing cash. Um, we've also, um, like I mentioned, we're a cooperative uh, made up of businesses, citizens, nonprofits, and local government agencies in our community, kind of like a stakeholder alliance. Um, and we've just put bylaws in place that will also allow us to have an investment class share that our members can buy. Um, we're trying to build beyond just the trade and the exchange mechanism, but also facilitate people investing their money into local businesses to build more value in the local economy, which can be traded with our local money inside our local trade network. So we're kind of trying to create this uh, this uh, the, this. Uh, feedback loop, the structure where you know, we can fis like, uh, formalize the trade um, and then take some of that, that, that surplus and reinvest it back in and keep driving it and building it out specifically for uh, meeting the needs of the people in the local economy. Um, I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> Dr. Cindy Logan. Okay. Um, we started about a year ago a currency called Mendo Food Future Credits. And it was NCO, WAG, and different community members. Um, we pooled our ideas to figure out what we could do to try to do some kind of local, local currency. Um, the reasons we started it were, one, to have a local currency to create more local buying. Um, we wanted to encourage bulk food, food storage. So we also wanted a currency that was backed by something, so we backed it with grain. Um, we also wanted to use the grain to get an emergency food supply put together. We also wanted to use it to stabilize prices. So each credit we had, we only printed as many credits as we had grain to cover. And each credit had a value that it held a year from the date that it was printed. So now a year later, we've gone through uh, 1,000 coupons. We have sold or given out 8,883 pounds of grains out of 10,000 pounds of grain. Um, 750 coupons have been redeemed out of that initial thousand coupons. So we had, you know, but there's problems that, that we have with it. Um, it's not widely used as a local currency. We 
don't have dedicated staff or volunteer time to market and bookkeep the actual, you know, getting the coupons out there on top of doing the grain project with it, which takes an ex extensive amount of time. Um, banks won't take the credits. Um, if we were able to get a bank to take the credits, then it would be easier to get local stores to take them. Um, and unless we could find support in marketing the credits, we're probably not going to be able to keep going with the credits. And then the other thing is, once the credits are redeemed for grain, they're out of circulation. Um, we didn't value the credits high enough from the get-go to allow for ongoing staffing to do the marketing and so on and so forth. And, you know, we're right at a crossroads now. Um, yes, we got $10,000 of credits out. Um, it, we thought it was a really good concept. Uh, one of the other things we were trying to accomplish with this was to create a ready market for farmers that would grow grain to have a place to sell grain. Uh, we do have farmers now that are growing grain in the county and we'll have our first grain crop since 1969 come in this, this season when they come in. Uh, so some of, some of the goals we had with this really have you know started working. Um, but the tie-in with the grain project and the, the credits We've fallen kind of short on the manpower hours to be able to just to get it out there. So we really don't know what the future of the credits are going to be. The concept of the grain-backed or backed currency, I think, is still a really good idea. Um, haven't been able to sell it to the banks, though, <laughs> so far. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's all I need to say on it right now. wondering from this sort of local currency, does anyone have ideas, and Derek, you might be working on this, on how to leverage investment income? Well, we can, uh, I mean, first of all, we have these bylaws that we just spent a good amount of money and um, time putting together um, to make sure that we can facilitate um, people investing into our co-op. So I don't know how many people are familiar with securities law. Um, not a lot. <laughs> but uh, there, there are, are many, many, many restrictions that keep um, Anybody that doesn't make a million or doesn't have a million dollars in net worth or make two hundred thousand dollars a year, investing in anything that's not registered or approved by both the state and uh, the SEC on a national level, um, you know, in order to get through that process, it costs a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars. So a small business trying to raise maybe most a million dollars would spend twenty to twenty-five percent of that just getting be able to raise it from the community. Um, so it really makes it kind of infeasible, um, but with some help with some really uh, innovative lawyers, um, the co-ops co have an exemption. You can raise up to $300 from a, of a member in, um, of equity capital without having to do anything um, as far as like uh, registering or, or um, so we're kind of looking at using our co-op as a funnel for that. So people invest in the co-op, they support our localization services, but also creates a pool which we can, we can invest in other local businesses and enterprises to build them up. And you know, running it through kind of a, a business development program, so it's not just here's a pile of money. It's uh, you know, here's how you can work to make your business successful and learn business skills and be a successful entrepreneur. So um, that's key because because local currencies are meant to facil facilitate exchange. One of the reasons why our financial system is having so much trouble is all of our money is based on these long-term bets, these speculative loans and bets um, that are, you know, go out decades um, and the interest associated with it won't get into that um, so what this what, what it what you know so to keep it out of the currency you can build another like a savings and investment program um, that can actually you know again build long-term value and then that value as it's built for for the community the more it's oriented towards the trading already going in the community the more it fits in and it can work with the local currency you know then to facilitate exchange um, and obviously um, exchange and savings and investment are very closely related. So um, one of the one of the downsides or one of the, the major structural issues with a lot of currency programs is there's no place for it to go. Um, it pools up usually at a grocery store and they have nothing they can do with it. Um, so the two things you really have to look at is one, you have to integrate the whole supply chain. You know, you have to get back. That's still, that, that, that grocery store or restaurant needs to be able to buy food with it. And you know, it, so the food producers need to be taking it. Plus, there needs to be a way to get the uh, the individual, the em employees in involved, so that they can get it for their salary, then get back to the retail and create those linkages all the way through. 
But then also in an economy, there's always a, there's always winners, people that do really well and you know gather lots of money, you know, successful businesses, and then people that need a little bit of help getting to the next level with their business, you know, or need a mortgage or something, get to get to the next level of their life. So if you can keep make it so that when surpluses build in certain areas, like at the grocery store, they can take it and reinvest it back in, and you know, not using it right now, reinvest it back in, reallocate it to somebody else. And they can, you know, that can be used to build more value and, you know, kind of the way we do now with our, you know, when we deposit money in a bank or we invest in our 401k or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, so that's a long answer. But, yeah, there's, it's, uh, it's, it, it needs to be really for this to work, to be really like the next phase of sustainable economics. There needs to be a holistic approach to that, you know, both with how exchange happens, how we're investing and building more enterprises, and also how we're tracking and accounting for what value and wealth really is. So... Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I make a comment on localizing our economy tied to energy and our energy costs because it's dollars already spent within the local communities. So whatever we do to invest in local energy production not only captures the increased cost of that energy over time as a profit to the local production of energy, but you're keeping your dollars locally that are going out of the community now for investing in things like this, your local economies and your retail sector. With this co-op exemption, is there a return to the investor? How would they, you know, if, if you can... Okay. Um, <laughs> we've had to think this all this stuff through. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're visualizing it. Well, first of all, there's a lot of potential here. Okay, well, we're looking, the way we're... we're Thinking about it, and by the way, we're not soliciting investment. I mean, exactly. <laughs> Yet, yeah, um, there's a lot of steps to be put in place before that. But there's tons of things you could do. Re investing in renewable energy, you know, even in a co-op structure for renewable energy and financing that co-op with local money. Um, I mean, but we look at it as building a broadly diversified local living economy is our ultimate goal. Um, now. Co-ops are interesting structures in their history it gives a lot of guidance on this too because a lot of people when they invest in a co-op they don't invest to get a return they invest to get discounts or you know discounted services or free services um, so you could invest to just to give people free access to um, to things like we have a tool library in Santa Rosa which is great it's free you can borrow tools and you know if if uh, people were just getting value for free then it's worth investing even if there's no actual return because you get that's your return but you can also balance it with uh, enterprises that are profit-making enterprises and so that you would invest and as they are successful then you would get either dividends or you know probably a dividend based or income based economy rather than a, um, a, a speculation like you know a market based buy and sell kind of thing because you want to you know eliminate the need for speculation and really match it with the value that's being added in over time um, so there's a, there's a number of ways you could have return, you know, whether it's just value or in some or in local money or in dollars or any combination of. And we've set our, our structure up so that our board of directors has the uh, monumental task of deciding how that works over time. You know, very flexible and open. Just whatever the board of directors just determines, because who knows how it'll all work out. But we're just trying to kind of get the get the container built and you know get the, the get it you know ready to go. So, but could you very briefly talk about the uh, tool library program in uh, Santa Rosa? Yeah, um, I have the pleasure to, uh, the tool library is run by a man named Dustin Zuckerman, who actually also uh, works at the JC Library uh, in Santa Rosa, and has done a number of libraries, and is now my brother-in-law, so that's cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but what he's done, um, he uses the, the kibbutz model um, in, um, in Israel, actually, um, which is, um, they, they have these kind of uh, social services where they're, they're almost like work training for, uh, for youth, that you go through this like work core program, and you produce stuff that's then essentially what they give out for free in the social services and you get an allotment of that and so it's kind of like this you know he likes the free model you know and so the way the tool library works totally free um, people donate their tools that have been sitting in their garage forever um, you sign up for an account and it works very much like a regular library you go and you borrow them and you get them for seven days and you bring them back um, and it's working surprisingly well with absolutely no money I mean they take donations in um, to help support administration but really low overhead um, we're right now kind of working with him on toy libraries, um, you know, clothing. There's a number of things that you could do where, you know, people have this stuff laying around that's at their house. They're not really using it. You know, car shares are a similar program. Um, and, you know, that could really work to kind of, you know, create community and, and allow people to get what they need at a, at a much lower price um, or free. How many people are, are involved? What kind of a board, if there is one that directs what's going on? 
how do, how do you set these things up? Like, is it how many people were involved and how did you get set up? Um, probably for the local currency part of this, Jason Bradford was probably the main spearhead of this. Um, and we started out with, I know, I see people in this room that were very involved in it in the beginning. So we probably had about nine, ten people as a core group when we were putting this together. And it, were, and it was just a group of people that were interested in trying to come up with some kind of local currency. And did you get a grant? Did you apply for a grant to help facilitate it? Um, no. Um, Oliver is crafting a currency in his head, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just would give all the credit for Mendo Mula to Dave Smith. Um, he's very good at getting other people to, to jump on board with him. And uh, I'm one of those people who said, yeah, we'll go ahead and do this. Tell me how to do it. And, and he did that. So I pretty much give the credit to Dave for starting this particular currency. For us. Um, since 2006, we've had a kind of a group of people that have been working to get our just our Bali network up and running. Um, and so now, um, and then over the last year, we made a lot of progress. Um, I actually formed a separate company outside to do the technology stuff around all this. Um, and so we probably have now about $80,000 of investment into that. Um, plus, you know, we kind of made a splash on the national scene. So we were able to get another 90000 in grants um, in, into our, uh, our project um, from that, you know, just getting out on the national scene and talking it up. Um, so that's, that's been good. And right now we have a five-member board of directors <coughs> at, in the co-op. And uh, Sustaining Technologies, who's doing this, has uh, made up of five uh, worker owners and about, uh, I think, four other um, kind of passive investors. <laughs> we want to keep it free so no coordinators or administrators get paid. And it's been fluctuating and I hope, um, you know, in the near future there are more plans to include more people and get more done, do more outreach and um, just generally do more. So uh, it's in process. So how do you work that into being a service as opposed to getting something in your hands? An hour, yeah. Generally, is it? something that you make or you grow, um, you would charge time credits for the time you spend. It's hard, in, in a lot of cases, it, it's hard to know, but you have to ask, give it your best guess and then money for the raw materials. It says it's in the internet, the, the time bank. Do you have an account and sign up or you go to a website and how do you access that exchange? Through, um, Time Banks USA, there's several hundred time banks around the US, it's, it's international. So they provide sort of a platform um, and then every person has their profile and then there's a, a give and receive page where you know it keeps track of everything and it also keeps track of the time. You log your hours and it, um, you have an account and it's like a bank account card. Great, so. thank you. And I have to say when I mentioned that this forum was going on, Someone sent me an email immediately saying, make sure to talk to the Time Bank. And we've been using them for years. This is um, Magnetic Graffiti, Kitty and Creek uh, sent us information right away that you guys should be part of this. Sorry, was there a question out there? Uh, particularly with the paper currencies, I'm concerned about controls on printing. How do you deal with that? Cindy? We thought about that a lot. <laughs> and uh, what we ended up using was a 40 year old, not available now, security paper that a local <laughs> printer had in his back room. <laughs> and just to tell a little story on this, uh, Cindy was speaking at a Bali conference and was talking about the food credits and made the mistake of not having the voided ones and passed around, you know, was talking to one of the speakers in the group and they said, well, that's a great, and they took it. And that was $10, $10 out of hers. You've got to make sure to use those. What about Mendemula? You know, there, there's really nothing that would necessarily keep anyone from uh, printing you know, these exactly like we have. But they are all individually numbered. So we know exactly what we've issued. And so if, if we, and we keep track of that. We actually, every day that these come in, we track the numbers that come back in. And I don't track Dave's money. Um, I don't want to have to track Dave's. <laughs> but um, I think that you know we know exactly what numbers are already issued. We know which of his are issued, too. So if we all of a sudden saw duplicated numbers coming in, we would know that we had a problem. But we don't have a way currently to deal with that. Um, we're, of course, just, I hope I'm not giving anyone any ideas, but we're hoping that nothing happens in, in that way. So. 
Um, we, uh, we do have a paper version too. Um, we, we primarily went this route because it's easier to control with the cards and, and all of that. Um, just a lot easier, a lot more secure. Um, um, the cards themselves? Um, no, they, they don't. But each each uh, particular person has a uh, their own identifier number. Um, you know, so I mean, it's easier. To, it's we can we can track irregularities in the system. Um, you know, people if it's something all of a sudden somebody's account just goes crazy. You know, we have ways to identify that. Um, we do have a paper. There's some really good security paper out there these days that if you try to do anything, you know, photocopy, do any of this stuff, um, it it pretty much won't let you. You know, so. Um, once you get a lot in circulation, that's when you start to have trouble keeping track of what's going on. Um, but the way we do it now, um, we're looking at a program, paper program associated with ours where we would, um, you know, a business, every business has their own account on this with a credit limit, and we could issue them paper certificates against their account and basically lend them to them, and then, you know, they can issue them out, and then they just have to either repay their loan in the, in the local uh, credit, paper credit, or they can accept them back in at their point of sale with the card and it just keeps track of it all like multiple mediums um, and it, again it, the less paper you have out there the easier it is to keep track of everything so what is the reward that you get for the time you have to spend in administering it good question um, well I think that I think the reward is that you know the the education that we're providing people who look at these and say wow what is this and you know the the, the question that we get most often is like what's it worth we say, well, it says five dollars right on there, but it's like, but that's that's not worth five dollars. <laughs> it's you know, and I understand what they're saying. Yeah, actually, it's only worth thirty cents. <laughs> but that's we're taking that loss. We're we're paying thirty cents to make this, and we're valuing it at five dollars, backed by a pint of beer. Issue: Where does the excess come to be able to compensate for people for the time they're spending? Um, if they're not, if they, if they are totally volunteering, I mean, you are volunteering in this aspect, but you are in a business, and so, I, I mean, I don't know, I don't have an answer to that. That's just always a big question for me. Just to answer for me, and I speculate that Dave feels this way as well, that this is a, kind of a, um, an avenue to get people to think about what, you know, local, what local means. And it started a lot of conversations with some unlikely people, actually. Um, I, as the chair of the Greater Ukiah Chamber of Commerce, I have a lot of people who never used the word local or sustainable that in the last five, six months are starting to use it. And that look at little, you know, things like this and start asking questions and are changing their minds about the way they think about, you know, supporting the local economy. So that, that I'd say is the biggest value to me. Um, we, we've had the, the, another reason why this is great is we don't have to promote it as a local currency. As soon as you start talking about local currency, most mainstream <coughs> business people and a lot of just people that don't understand what's going on just close off. So we talk about it as a marketing program. Um, you know, for the businesses, like, look, if we can get people engaged and we can shift 10% of spending locally, we've generated the numbers looking at locally owned, you know, a local spending, you know, and, and what people spend their money on. I mean, that's, we were looking at, you know, billions of dollars more spending or uh, more recirculation from the economic multiplier, and if they're shifting, like that goes to our locally owned businesses. So, yeah, you have to pay a small percentage of the transactions that run through it, but it's well worth it for you because if we can really make this shift happen and you're on board, it's going to come back to well, you and things like that. Most people are paying for you know, credit card fees. Most people don't even realize when they pay with a credit card that it's costing the merchant and that that money is going who knows where, probably not even. I I won't, I won't say the name of the business, but our biggest hardware store uh, member, $1.1 million a year in credit card transaction fees. So a number of years ago, uh, Daryl Cherney and I were working up a plan to do a silver coin called the Ecotopia coin, and it was solid silver. And we did some pricing, and I started, nobody was really doing this much of a research job, and I'm not an economist, but we realized it was going to cost us to print them. And, what was going to happen, and then maybe it was just going to be a tourist thing, and it was going to leave the county, and how could it valuation be kept? And we just got into such a thing with valuation and the whole administrative cost of printing, uh, we kind of gave up. And then uh, a few years later, Michael Stewart uh, picked that up again with the idea of silver. Have any of you talked about valuing your currencies with something concurrent like a commodity like gold or silver. This, this is my this is my favorite conversation because there's a, there's a lot of confusion about money and and when you have a 
the unit of account is important, okay? You don't have to have a currency be backed by something in order to be valued in that, okay? Really what the unit of accounting, whether it's, a, whether it's an hour or a dollar or, uh, you know, pounds of grain, what it is is a benchmark for people that are using it to value it against other things, okay? So that benchmark needs to be pretty much like widespread for people to understand what it is. Um, my favorite benchmark, my ideal benchmark in our conversations is, is what I would call a, a daily well-being index. Okay, so what does it look like for a day in a life of well-being? And let's break that up and use that as our benchmark, whether it's the goods, services, whatever it is. Um, in reality, that's hard to do. So, um, what, what uh, and, and it's well explained in this book too, but um, right now we're using the dollar because we don't want people to have to run multiple accounting systems. That's tough. Right, um, but eventually um, we, we will probably, as the dollar gets less stable, um, we'll shift to a benchmark uh, using a basket of commodities um, that are easily measured in value against the dollar. So as the, if the dollar takes a nosedive, um, you, you still have that kind of basket of commodities that again are widely spread and used in in the community and trading like network. Um, you could use you could use. They, isn't that how they designate property? In, in our current system, like a basket of yeah. goods and what you could buy with that? I'm pretty sure it's like I mean, it's similar to our, our, our consumer price index. Um, you could look at food would be included, energy would be probably be included. Um, you know, I mean, you, you, you can think through, just, just think about goods and services that you use. And probably, you know, again, ones, ones that are, in order to do the valuation, it, it's best to have ones that are traded on an exchange pretty regularly, you know. Um, Necessity. Necessities, yeah, really, and and so what, then what you do is you can say at any day you can say okay we're we're not no longer having the dollars in your account. Here's our new benchmark, and you value it against that dollar the dollar at day one, and then from there it can float against the dollar. So if the dollar goes down, that basket of commodities, the price in dollars will go up. So um, and that's a way to kind of measure a unit of account. So when you're thinking it through again, it's just a just a benchmark, whether it's an hour or a dollar or you know it's pound or whatever. Right. Or beer, a pint of beer. That's that's one of my favorite benchmarks, actually. <laughs> now you charge a percentage for transaction fee, which helps pay for the, your system and give you some investment as well as administration costs. And it's a common model that's already in use that could transfer to all these other forms pretty easily. Uh, what is the percentage? I mean, credit card companies are between two and five percent. More. So, so well, we, we more. spend a lot of time and money making it non-credit card network based. Okay? okay, so all the transactions run through internet, uh, high-speed internet, which okay. is basically free these days if you look at the grand old scheme of things. Um, that creates problems with making it work easily, but it also you know kind of frees that now. Um, right now it's free because we're in a test phase. We're just really trying to get businesses to get on board and, and cardholders to use it. Um, you have to become a member of the cooperative in order to use it as a business or as an individual. So it's $25 a year to become a member as an individual and based on the size of your business. Okay. On top of that, we're, we'll probably start with a, a, a minimum monthly fee of somewhere in the $20 to $30 range. Um, and we may look at subsidizing that for the smallest of the businesses, um, doing maybe 1% of transactions up to a cap. So, you know, the big stores aren't doing millions of dollars, having to pay millions of dollars, but, you know, cap it at a few hundred bucks a month at the most, you know, for the biggest of the businesses. And if you get it, and we're also basing our business model on the ex, uh, exporting this model and the system to other communities. So we don't have to make all of our money just in Sonoma County and ring it. You know, we can, it's technology that's scalable, so we can do these, you know, there's hundreds of these localization networks throughout the country. And uh, you know we've built a pretty strong platform just from a website platform, business directory, events, and all integrated with this rewards currency well, thing. We just threw four answers at that one question, which is that you have a membership uh, <coughs> annual fee or, or sign up fee, a monthly fee, a potential percentage charge, and uh, that you're for internet high speed base. Mm -hmm. And, and we also, I mean, our biggest money maker this year will probably be our campaigns. So, you see Drink Local. We have Bank Local, uh, Made Local, where we're going to be identifying locally made products in grocery stores. Um, and we're looking at Build Local and Eat Local probably. But I mean, we just got a $20,000 sponsorship from one of our big banking members because they, they want the Bank Local campaign to be their main marketing tool. And so we have these little sponsorship slots under these marketing campaigns. And we balance public education, talking about why banking local, identifying all the local banks, all that stuff with kind of sponsorship and, and uh, advertising opportunities and just trying to create a nice little balance there where it's not obtrusive but can support the ongoing organization. So. Um, 
I'm assuming there's no interest. Is that true? Um, on our exchange system, we do not plan on having any interest attached with it. Um, you know, we do have transaction fees associated with this rewards program. Um, and and uh, we, we also, it, we want to make it more based on service fees just to cover overhead because we know there's expenses but not interest based that will be charged on the entire amount. Uh, we're, we're focusing, we're fo well first of all, uh, when, you, when you create money by lending at interest, that creates sustainability problems because the money for the interest isn't created and we won't go into that, you know, high, high money conversation. But um, we're trying to focus more on, on kind of the Islamic banking idea of shared risk, shared responsibility. And so what we're hoping is that most of the capital we raise will be equity oriented. Um, so because you're sharing risk and you're sharing responsibility for the way those businesses that you're invested in operate, you get uh, a return on your investment for taking on that, that risk and sharing that responsibility. Um, but it's only with pre-existing money, not using fractional reserve to, you know, I've been too, too complicated here, but um, we, we, have, we have a lot of knowledge on why the interest burden money system is not uh, sustainable and we're using that knowledge as we build our systems um, to hopefully complement and eventually replace. Um, is there a way that we can take that uh, co-op uh, idea and plug it into the, the granary system so that people in this community can invest? We can make investments into that. Is there a way that could happen through the bank? I mean, like you would, I have investments in other places. Why couldn't I in, somehow invest in that and what we're doing here? And why couldn't more of us? Right, we're not set up to do that right now, but looking at his system where they've done a lot of legwork on figuring out how you can make investments, um, it would probably be a good thing to talk at another time. Make sure to stop by Brett's. Uh, only certified organic brew pub, or first one? Yeah, first. There is another one now in Portland, okay. Oregon as well. Okay, there you go. First certified organic brew pub when you're in Ukiah, and Derek is so kind to come up and speak to us today. He represents a lot of other businesses in the uh, Sonoma area. If you see these uh, go, go Local Sonoma stickers in Windows, please frequent those businesses, because it really does help our money stay, if not here local, it helps it stay in the community where it does the most good. So thank you, all of you guys. <laughs>